As a learning project for Fusion 360, we're going to design each a marble run. The idea of this exercise is to provide a realistic design example, but in simple form, for us to develop our CAD skills. We're not going to build it, although this is the sort of project that does get built in this, kind of, in this class. But the idea is to choose an objective that requires designing several parts that fit together to correctly use in-context design in a multi-part assembly and aim to make it well-dimensioned and well-constrained so that it can be iterated and, and manipulated and developed. Students who are really new to Fusion 360 or, or Parametric CAD in general should choose a fairly simple goal here and not make it too complicated just to keep it under, under control because the CAD itself can take a lot of time. Students who have more familiarity should perhaps choose to add some more features like an actuator or a sensor, something to think through more how to make a, a complex design um, using other parts. I've started with a fairly simple example because my, my goal in this video is to actually draw it end to end and so I, I wanted to keep it fairly under control. The first step is always to do some hand drawings. And I simply showed on the whiteboard here kind of a simple sketch of a device, which is, as, a, as ball runs go, not that complicated. It's effectively an executive decision toy that makes a binary outcome. The idea is there's a slope platform, and a ball that's introduced kind of in this area will roll downhill, and there's a couple of dowel pins marked in orange. Um, one will allow it to bounce left or right, and then the other will hopefully capture it into an end position, and the ball will come to rest in, in one of several states here at the end. And we'll find that to get that to work, we'll have to sort of fine-tune some positions of things for the given size marble, and, uh, and perhaps to get it to work. The chief objective of this drawing was to get a sense of the overall uh, uh, shape and the overall number of parts, just so I have some sense of how to organize my Fusion 360 model. So we can see what I have here in this, in this design is I have a play field, that's part number one, which is the sort of trapezoidal part viewed here from the top. Um, in the side view, uh, that is the sloped uh, part here that's shown in, 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 by its side, side profile. And um, in addition, there's a, there's a number two is a kind of single central strut that holds it off the base. Number three is a flat base plate that, that it goes on the ground that supports it on the table. Parts four and five are, are symmetric. There's sidewalls that guide the ball down the center. And then I haven't added numbers for the standard parts. I'm gonna use dowel pins from the kit that press into the play field to form the pins. And then I've indicated my connection points in green. I'm planning that there won't be any, any specific fasteners, but there'll be, um, you can see here, there's gonna be tabs where the, the parts fit in um, slots uh, as they sort of all fit together at effectively right angles and then there'll be holes for the, um, the dowel pins to go in. So that's the sketch. Uh, and this can be articulated as the, time, as the design goes on, but what I can see off the bat is there's a slope to adjust, there's some spacing here uh, uh, between the, the pins and the walls that need to be adjusted, and perhaps some overall shapes that might be adjusted. So I'm gonna make sure that I draw things in a way that allow me to manipulate those parameters as I go and, um, and fine tune the outcome even after I've drawn some of it. Okay, so I'm gonna, Pause for here a second and hide away uh, my drawing for now and open up the CAD system. So here we are, Fusion 360, new drawing, empty drawing. Let's get started. So I'm gonna offer a strategy which I think works quite well for these sort of simple symmetric assemblies which um, I often start with drawings at the top level. So in Fusion 360, one can have sketches that exist in the, in the design itself, not within a subcomponent. And that is a way to have some common drawing features that are shared by multiple parts. In this kind of drawing where there aren't that many parts and it's very symmetric, if I, if I choose uh, like a midline plane here, I'm going to choose the YZ plane, I can draw features on this that will then help govern everything else and it keeps a lot of my parameters in one location. This is distinctly different from having some sketches which will be within the components and, and then easier to reference from inside that component. So let's just look from the left here and start by making just some, some construction lines. Uh, I'm going to think about the fact that I might have some offset up and then a tilt. So I'm going to go ahead and just, uh, just to start pinning things down a little bit, I'm going to dimension my tilt. And I'm going to, for now, I'm going to say 7 degrees, and we might come back and adjust that later. So that, that helps define uh, some kind of basic property. Let's sort of think about getting the overall scale right here. If I take this, uh, this construction line, sorry, if I now add a, a construction line along the bottom here, uh, I'm sorry, I'll actually add a construction line along the kind of plane 
So I drew a line here. I'll, I'll use the line. Let's add, a, let's add a dimension for the length of that face. And I'm going to say 150 millimeters um, as a kind of realistic sort of uh, length for what that playfield might be like. And that helps me to kind of get a, an overall scale set on my drawing here. All right, so now I have roughly the kind of uh, size and shape there. And then while we're at it, let's go ahead and think about how big should my foot be. And remember, drawing a profile view here. So I'm kind of just giving some working dimensions. And say maybe my foot will be about 120 millimeters long. And we know it's going to be 6 millimeter plywood. So I can go ahead and get that in scale and get that in there. So that helps me to visualize how the parts fit together. I see now that um, I can go ahead and uh, maybe think a little bit more about the the height of the um, sort of bottom corner of the play field here off the ground plane. Sometimes getting your dimensions to go to the right spot takes a little fussing. Sorry, what's going on here? See, there's going to be a lot of fussing in this video as I kind of just uh, do what is normally an unspoken process quite verbally. All right, so that's enough to kind of pin down some really basic parameters of the device. I get the sense of where the positions are in space and where the, um, just the kind of general overall scale. So I'm going to finish that. That's my, that's going to be a kind of a guide sketch for the top. Now I'm going to just, in the first phase of this exercise only asks you to draw one part, but one central part. So for me, I believe in this, in this design, the play field defines a lot of things. If I can draw the play field, I can draw the other parts around it. So I'm going to construct a plane, um, to use as a, so I'm going to construct a, a plane at angle, and I'm going to pick my construction line as that plane. So I'm constructing a plane that goes through a line on a sketch. And if I leave the angle at 0, that will now be the plane in which the sketch for the play field can be drawn. It's the, effectively the back face of the play field. If I draw a sketch there and extrude it, I'll get my play field oriented in space at its final location. It's still parameterized because the 7 degrees is a parameter that we can find in the top level sketch. So given that, now I'm going to go ahead and do the first thing we always do when we start an, uh, an object, which is start a new component. I'm going to call it playfield. This will keep all of my sort of playfield geometry within the component and allow it to be moved independently um, and have a, a, a notable identity. So at this point, I can pick this plane I just created, create a sketch in it. Um, I can say look at to kind of get me an orthogonal view. OK, and now I can start actually drawing. The first thing I do is it is a symmetric part. So I'm going to go ahead and um, add a, a center line. Actually, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to take my existing center line here, and I'm going to project it onto this plane. What that does is it brings it in in purple. It's a line that's derived from another sketch feature. And so it's in our sketch within the component, but its source is the line from the global drawing. And what that does is it makes sure that my center line length and, and position is all referenced to my previous sketch. So it'll be associative. If I change that length in the top level sketch, it'll change here as well. So that gives me a starting point for thinking about what my shape should be. And what I drew, had drawn was, uh, I'm going to draw this now as actual final contour lines because I'm going to really use these for the part. Um, I have some kind of like trapezoidal shape, right? I'm going to start by just drawing half of it, um, adding a constraint there to make that horizontal in the drawing. And then I'm going to mirror it. I know it's symmetric. If I go ahead and just use a mirror operation, then I will automatically um, get the right kind of relationships uh, that, I, that I need to maintain um, overall kind of dimensional compatibility. So now we can go ahead and uh, dimension between the top corners. This will be a parameter that we're going to want to fix later. So I'll give it a number, but we're also going to, I'll show you in a bit how to give it a name. And we're going to pick something for the bottom. Same story. We're going to make it a, a number, but we'll eventually make it a name. All right, so that is a reasonable starting sort of shape for my play field. I'm going to go ahead and extrude that. Six millimeter plywood is our material, so I'm going to give it a six millimeter thickness. And I have kind of the base form now. So let's start to detail a little bit more. We know there's going to be some uh, slots for the side barriers and some slots for the central uh, support sort of rib that goes down the center. Um, so I'm going to create a new sketch in this uh, top face. And let's start with the rib part. So once again, um, I can go ahead and I'm going to momentarily turn off my body here. We're going to pick that previous center line we had, and once again, project it to this drawing as well, because we, we like that one, um, to use as a center line. And then um, go ahead back to look at. 
So let's go ahead and draw some slots. These are going to be uh, slots for tabs from the rib that's in, uh, underneath it on the midline. And so for this, I can create a rectangle. I can create a center rectangle, uh, center it on that line, give it some size. And now we want to just, we, I'm just going to actually assign dimensions because we can say it's going to be 15 millimeters long, and I'm going to say it's 6.2 millimeters wide. That's like a, uh, a design chosen to allow for a little bit of material tolerance on the thickness of a, of a, of a plywood part. And it's a reference 15 millimeters long, which I will then use, make design a tab to match it. Um, I'm going to create another uh, similar rectangle um, here for the other tab on that. And then I'm going to start assigning some equality constraints. I know that the thickness should be the same. So I'm going to uh, make the short legs equal in length, make the long legs equal in length. Now, in terms of design logic, what I know I care about most here is that this part has to match the other part in some meaningful way. There's a lot of ways I could I could make this happen. I can reference the part to this part. I could try to give these dimensions with respect to each other. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to first I'm going to dimension it relative to the lower edge, so I have this placed in some sensible location on this part. And then um, because I want this part to be able to stretch in its length. Um, I want the whole thing to be stretchable, but I actually don't want the base to get all that much bigger. So we're going to kind of limit the overall scope of that by just saying that these have to be a fixed distance apart. And what I'm saying is I want the play field to be variable even if the base is not. It's a design choice. There's a lot of ways this could go about, but I've, now I've got a concrete choice about that, that I'm going to sort of fix this distance, and they, that will not work for every play field length. If the play field gets too short, they won't be in the part. But that captures my estimate of what I'm going to do in terms of overall variation. So given that now, I can go ahead and uh, do an extrusion. And now, because I, I just the subtleties of that purple line is a solid line instead of a dashed line, it tries to create a, a different profile on the left and right side of that. But I can just use them all together and make a cut. And I'll do, I'll do what my normal habit is here is, it would be fine to just cut all the way through. But I think it's actually more robust in general to always pick to object and select the back face so that the cut is defined as going precisely through the material no farther. Um, that just as a habit tends to cut down on extraneous cuts and errors later on. So those are tabs that tab slots that can be used for the central rib that will support this. Let's go ahead and think. Let's make another sketch now and think about on the same face here and think about uh, the slots for our edge barriers. So I'm going to turn on the construction flag and just draw a line to represent the sort of axis that I think the barrier will go along. And this is this is like a. Um, this is a really this is a construction line. Um, I have some freedom where I place it, but we're gonna just make it go end to end, and we're gonna make it parallel to the side because I want that barrier to parallel to the side. I'm gonna have to sort of pick now a number. Like I want the inset to be enough to allow the slots not to break through. So I'm gonna say nine millimeters. Um, so that's that is sort of using the logic of this part. Now it will be tied to the edge. If the overall trapezoidal angle of this play field changes, it'll always stay parallel, and that's what I want. So let's think about now where that, that part might slot in. Now this is a, a play field part that comes in from the top. It's a side barrier that I'll separately design for laser cutting that will press fit in from the top with tabs into some slots. So now because my slots are at a funny angle, I'm going to use the um, three-point rectangle, um, turn off construction, and I'm going to draw, again, a, two sl a slot here, and I'll draw a slot here. All right, now I'll kind of zoom down into the bottom here and think about dimensioning this. Now, one general rule of thumb is I always try to minimize the number of numbers that are in the model. If, if there's a logical relationship, I try to express it using a constraint, not an extra number. It just cuts down on repetition and cuts down on mistakes. So here I can say the length of this is equal to the length of my previous slot because it's based on the same material. If for some reason, I had to fine tune the slot width for material thickness, then I have one less place to change that number. Likewise, I'm just going to go with the same 15 millimeter slot design and just say those can also be equal. Then I'm going to apply a symmetry constraint so that this new slot is, is placed around that axis I just drew. And then I'm going to constrain the second, the upper slot to be uh, have the same kind of relationships as the first. I'm going to do it just, just, for, just for a variety here. I'm going to actually do this using a collinear constraint on the edges of the slot. There's a lot of ways to express this relationship. It'll, it'll inadvertently, or sort of as a, as a result of that collinear relationship, make it uh, symmetric around the same axis, just because all the lines here are parallel. Um, 
it sort of expresses the idea in some sense that it's a flat plane of material, so the edges are going to be collinear across space. Whatever you want to think about it, it's a different way of accomplishing the same end. I do have to place an equality constraint on the, the edge of the kind of tab length. Now I'm going to actually do one more extra line here. For this kind of tab, I do actually like to uh, reference it by its center. It's more stable. If I change the length, if I change my tab width at some future date, um, it depends on what the thinking here is. Uh, but in general, my preference is, and yours may vary, is to think about the center to center distance as a constant, even if the tab width changes. So what I do is I'm drawing an extra construction line across the middle of each of these slots using the midpoint constraint to make it right across the midline. And then I'm going to choose here to make a dimension between the midlines. Actually, I can do between the, these, these particular midline points. And if I get just the right point, okay, there I'm going to sort of center to center distance, and I'm going to make it 100. Um, and these, again, may need to be adjusted later. Uh, but that's actually like a pretty good sort of starting point for getting a pin down design. All right, so those would be the slots for the tabs that are the sidewalls of my marble run. Um, I'm going to finish that sketch and go ahead and do another extrusion where I'm going to take these two features, both of the profiles, and once again, I'm going to create a cut and I'm going to, I'm going to pin it to the back face as the, as the end object to get just the depth cut. You see, you notice I only did one half. At this point, I'm now going to express the idea that my part is ultimately symmetric by um, creating a mirror of the features themselves. So, um, sorry, mirror, mirror, mirror. Okay. So the pattern type will be features. I could, you can do various kinds of mirrors, but in this case, what I'm going to do is, if you look down in the in the um, design design history, the extrusion itself was a feature. And I can simply pick that as a thing to mirror, and the entire cut will be mirrored. So then that is that is the object that's being mirrored, is this entire cut that has two separate slots. As a mirror plane, I can then pick my, my midline plane. I have a fairly symmetric design, a totally symmetric design here. So I can pick the mirror plane as the midline plane, and I'll get my extra set of cuts. So now I have captured there as one step in the design history, a mirroring operation, which produces the features for the other side of the play field. As a final step here, I'm going to uh, add a fillet. This is just for beautification. Um, although my personal preference is I do like filleting the corners of laser cut parts just to cut down on the sharp corners that can cut you. Uh, it makes them just a little bit more friendly. And even a tiny, there, just a tiny little curve is enough to make them no longer a sharp point. Just gives it a little bit of, of softness there. Okay, so there's a part. It's my playfield part. Um, before we go on and do the dollop-in holes, let's just think for a second about what parameters I want to be working with here. So there is a, there is a, uh, a menu, an option for uh, change parameters, which you can find at the bottom of the modify menu. And what it does is it brings up a dialog which has all of the model parameters in a big set of tables. And you can do this from within sketches. Sometimes it's, it's easier to do it as you go, or you can kind of do it after the fact. But some of the, of the sketches features here can be named in a way that makes them easy to modify. So let's look at my seven degrees. Instead of calling that D1, I'm going to call that slope. And I'm going, to, I'm going to favorite it so it shows up at kind of top level, easy to modify. I'm going to think about my, my, my 150 millimeters. That was the long axis of my play field. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to call that play field underscore length. And I'm going to favorite it. Um, now I'm going to go into the playfield sketch, and I'm going to find my, uh, I've already forgotten what they were called. It has to be, I think, the sketch one was the one that was the overall profile. So 100 was the top width of, of the playfield. And then the 60 was the bottom, bottom width. And, and here, wait, how you, how you uh, name things makes life a lot simpler. I'm going to actually change that to playfield top width and play field bottom it just to help, help me keep those straight. Obviously, the names are your choice. Um, and favorite that. So now if you look at the top here, the favorite section, I have like four key parameters of this device uh, kind of labeled and highly available at the top level here. And now we can directly manipulate those and then just see them immediately propagate into the design. I'm going to try to uh, find a, oops, sorry here, I'm trying to find a better uh, view axis. Um, there, okay. So now I said, well, seven degrees, ah, doesn't seem steep enough. Let's make that 10 degrees. 
Okay, well, it's still not steep enough. Let's make that 15 degrees. Okay, we can see the effect. And we'll see in, in, later, in the later video when I do the full design that if we've correctly associated the other parts with the dimensions, um, then they will also modify and change. So we will see if the feet change and the central rib also moves with these dimensions. We could also try making the play field longer. Let's make it a little longer. And sure enough, it gets a little longer. It's a little narrow in angle because the width hadn't changed. Um, that's 60 at the bottom. Maybe that's a little wide. Let's make that 50. Okay, that's narrower. Um, now, you can see this also, also can fail. I've made some choices about the tab locations that are not compatible with every parameter. If I make this down to 140, starting to squeeze in there, make that 120, all of a sudden part my tab is partly outside the body of the material. So here's a case where by making a concrete choice early in the process about how I was going to structure my kind of offsets, I do limit the total range that I can vary the other parameters. And that's a, just, a, just a question about what you think the design, how it will evolve. No design can tolerate an infinite range of design of design var parameter variation. Anything but the most trivial designs have some sort of other constraints that end up applying. But if you can, if you choose carefully, you can allow your design to change over a pretty reasonable range of values and um, and still work out. Okay, so that is um, kind of uh, the first level there of drawing and featuring. Let's come back now. We're still in the play field. We have still the same component here and do one more sketch for the dowel pins. And I'll now get a sense of whether I cram things in a little too tightly. So let's uh, create another sketch for the dowel pin holes. Um, we're looking at it uh, directly. And I'm going to basically draw a circle. Um, I want a center line here. Sorry, what am I doing? All right, leave that. Um, I'm going to try to once again, OK, I have a center line. I'm going to project that center line onto this drawing just to have a center line. Um, and now I'm going to draw a circle that is centered at the bottom. And I'd have to look up exactly what dimension I want. These are nominally uh, quarter inch dowel pins. So I'm going to just dimension it um, slightly undersized. Uh, a quarter inch would be 6.35 millimeters. I'm going to make it uh, 6.2 millimeters. And effectively, I'm assuming that it'll cut slightly oversized, like 6.4, and that'll be within tolerance for a, a quarter inch dowel pin that's designed to press fit into a quarter inch hole, although I should really take my calipers and verify that. And then it is starting to look like this is a little crammed in here as a feature. Um, I might consider dimensioning this to be, um, that's seven and change. Let's just make it eight millimeters off the bottom because I want to be able to uh, have enough material at the bottom of the hole not to punch out when I actually cram that in there. So it's definitely cl too close to the slot. We're going to have to have to go back and fix things. Let's now think about adding my second dowel hole another circle on the same center line here. And once again, we're going to make, use the equality constraint to make the diameters equal so that um, they're just tied together as relative to the other dowel pin part. And um, I'm also just going to, just for thinking through the problem, I'm going to dimension them on a center to center basis. There's a lot of choices here. And we'll just sort of say 35 millimeters apart. So that's kind of a guess. No, let's make it 40. Um, you know, my sketch was accurate, but not so accurate that there's definitely some amount of fussing in the, in, the, in the individual details. I was trying to capture topology in the sketch and overall parts count, but not necessarily the most subtle of dimensional interactions. So um, for this level of complexity, it's not hard, it's not so bad to, to draw things in a way that you can then go back and do a sort of continual series of minor adjustments of parameters to make them work. Getting the topology right is really the most important first step because changing the fundamental topology of your model is usually a lot harder than just changing some numbers. So let's go ahead and extrude those profiles. Uh, OK, I, okay. I ended up with a solid line in the middle, so each half of the circle is a separate profile, but I can combine them. And once again, do the cut through uh, to object, pick the back face. OK, they're a hole right through the part. Um, all right, so that's not so bad, but I do want to go back now and subtly tune the, the, the geometry of that central rib uh, tab structure. So if I go to my play on, on, the, on the browser here, I can come in and look at under my uh, sketches. And I haven't named my sketches, but I can kind of uh, quickly, I don't remember where they were. Okay, there we go. Sketch two is actually those central holes. I can now go back and edit that sketch. Now it is tricky because we've gone backward in time. If you look at the, at the design history, um, the, the, the features and sketches that occur after the sketch are grayed out because they're currently not, not visible. So one has to be a little careful in, in these processes. 
Um, if you haven't named the parameters such that you can just change it in one step and you're going to re-enter the sketch to modify it, um, sometimes there's a little fussing back and forth to try to remember what's there. If I finish this sketch, uh, it will recompute through the feature tree and I'll see, I can see the whole part there. If I'd given it a name, I could have just simply gone to the change parameters and modified it. Um, but at this, at this stage here, instead I'm um, I'm editing sketch two, and here's a second way to get to that. I'm going to right click on the on the sketch in the in the capt in the history here, and say edit sketch, and kind of get to it more directly, and just try thirty. And for these this this kind of design, uh, a little a little manual fine tuning is perfectly fine, um, without going crazy on too many parameters. So twenty seven millimeters. That ended up being a slightly off number, but that looks okay. So at this point in the design, I still have, I still have complete freedom about that because I haven't drawn any other parts, and there's nothing external that depends upon this. So that gives me a, a pretty good starting point for this design. So like I said, this is a, a more or less complete solution for the phase one of this project, where I say, consider a complete design, um, draw it first, work out the number of parts and the relationship and how they might connect, think through the overall symmetries, overall parameterization, uh, go ahead and create a model. I do recommend this kind of top-down design where you start with some top-level sketches that exist at kind of the document level, because um, it will help you to lay out where things are and to set some very high level parameters um, immediately, um, get some dimensions named, um, get get other part, get one other part, some kind of core part drawn, um, detailed enough that we have all the part, all the features on it we think we might need, um, but then use detailed in a way such that it can still be modified. So there's a logical relationship, symmetries are reflected in the model. Um, everything is dimensioned enough to make it make it sort of a concrete part, and then uh, make sure that uh, parameters are named at the change parameters level, so we can get back and see them.